Well, if you have a Bible in front of you, do turn uh, to Psalm 143. Shall we pray as we come to God's Word? The prophet Isaiah writes, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. O oh Lord, we pray tonight, would you comfort our hearts? In a psalm that speaks of difficult days, of pleading with you, Lord, would you bring the comfort of your great character and the comfort of the gospel to bear in our hearts tonight, we pray. Amen. There are moments, aren't there, where the Lord seems close. When we're worshipping the Lord joyfully, uh, when his word seems to speak directly to our souls, maybe even in times of suffering, but where we feel the, the tenderness of Christ, almost as if he's there with us in the pain, binding up our wounds. There are moments when the Lord seems close. But that is not always the case. Many of us will have experienced days, weeks, years, where joy seems almost absent, where we're plunged into darkness, where we're desperate maybe for the Lord, but he seems far off. I think most people have had those kind of times. And tonight our psalm is very honest about that. It's a psalm of David and he writes from a dark place. And yet I pray by the end tonight, here in the midst of these painful words, we will find God's grace shining most brightly. So let's get into the, the psalm. And we begin with David praying urgently. Look at verse 1. He starts, Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In difficult circumstances, David, he pleads for God's mercy, for kindness, for help, for some kind of relief. Now, we're going to dig deeply into his prayer in a moment, but there is something we need to grasp before we begin. And that's the basis of David's prayer. That's where we start tonight the basis of David's prayer just look at the rest of verse one Lord hear my prayer listen to my cry for mercy in your faithfulness and righteousness come to my relief as he prays David appeals to God's faithfulness that he's dependable that he never goes back on his word and to God's righteousness that he's always most true pure and just of course, that leaves David with a problem. Look at verse 2. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. How could David, a sinner, appeal to God's righteousness? Surely God's righteousness should mean David's condemnation and judgment. As David prays, he knows this. He knows the state of his own heart, that he is not completely holy, that he doesn't deserve mercy from God in himself because he's a sinner. So how can he appeal to God? How can he pray like he does in this psalm? Well, it's expressed very simply here, but friends, this is the foundation for any of us having hope, for any of us praying like this. David cries out to God and he cries for mercy. And this is the basis of his prayer. And it's the very heart of the gospel to say, look, I'm not righteous, but I depend on your promise, Lord, to show mercy to your people, to justify the ungodly according to grace. Paul seems to reference this verse in Romans 3, teaching about the great sinfulness of mankind. But we know where Romans 3 goes, don't we? It goes on to explain God's mercy in Christ, that sinners can be justified according to his righteousness as satisfaction is made at the cross. The righteous one given for the sinner so that the sinner is made righteous. That's the foundation for David's prayers. He depends on God's faithfulness and his righteousness to show mercy to one who is trusting in him. He prays, Lord, be faithful to answer your servant. He confesses his sin. 
Don't answer me because of my goodness, not because of my merit. But Lord, answer me because of your righteousness and your faithfulness, because you have dealt righteously with my sin. That is the basis of his prayer. Friends, before anything, whatever you face, this is the only approach to God. It's the only way we can have our prayers heard and answered. It's to come seeking his mercy. To come to God by his grace. Because he is faithful and just to forgive sinners who trust in the Lord Jesus. And all the experiences that we're about to read in this psalm come through this lens. Out of this context that David is a forgiven sinner. That he's a believer, that he seeks the mercy of God. And so he bravely calls himself a servant of God. Because that's what he is in Christ. But servant of God though he is, his circumstances are horrible. And in the first half of the psalm, we get an insight into his experience. In himself, he experienced deepening darkness. And in his relationship with God, he experienced desperation. And we're going to consider each of those in turn. Second tonight, we see David's experience of deepening darkness. What's the reason for his urgent prayers in this psalm? Well, verse 3, the enemy pursues me. He crushes me to the ground. He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. Now, we're not told who the enemy was. Maybe it's Saul pursuing him, trying to kill him. Maybe it's Absalom, his own son, threatening his life. We don't know, but the experience is terrible. Literally, the enemy has pursued my soul. It feels like his soul is besieged. There's no let up, no escape, nowhere to go. And he crushes me to the ground. In his inner being, he feels like he's being pressed in a vice, trodden down, lower and lower He makes me dwell in the darkness like those long dead. He feels like he's living in the darkness of the grave itself, cut off from the land of the living. Yes, he's still breathing, but such is the darkness of his situation, it seems there is little hope or light. Maybe some of us know those feelings when your inner being is surrounded seemingly by darkness. When there's no let up, when hope or joy seem so distant, seeming to have slipped through your fingers long ago. That was David's experience. Yes, there were external circumstances around him, but he speaks of his soul, of of his life, and of darkness pressing in, and of feeling crushed. In fact, the language there of enmity and, and crushing, they bring us right back to the garden, don't they? There the Lord cursed the serpent, saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will crush his heel. David is experiencing something of this enmity. He's a follower of God, part of the offspring of the woman, but the forces of darkness assail his soul, seeking to crush him. Brothers and sisters, if we belong to Jesus, we are at enmity with satan and he will do what he can to crush our souls he will bring the forces of darkness to bear now don't mishear me i'm not saying that all sense of hopelessness or or darkness or depression are direct attacks from satan there are many factors there's our biology our personality and, and the providence of god in our circumstances but underneath all darkness that we face, there is this reality that we have great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and they will seek to sow darkness. They will seize on depression. And they want nothing more than to crush our spiritual life. And these assaults can be awful. Look at verse 4. So my spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. The word for spirit there is breath. David feels weak, feeble, like he's breathing out his last breath. My my heart within me is 
dismayed. The word dismayed there could be translated appalled or desolate or paralyzed. David feels like he's cut off from life and, and joy. Yes, he's a, a follower of God, but he doesn't feel the warmth of God's presence. He, he feels disconnected, stunned, hurt. And he feels like he's slipping only deeper and deeper into this darkness. And I need to be honest tonight. Believers do face dark times. You might know that feeling of slipping down deeper and deeper. You might know the feelings of an empty ache within or of not having any way to cope. Or like the light of hope has just been switched off. And Psalm 143, it doesn't back away from such an experience. If you know that feeling of deepening darkness, or if you know those who do walk in deep valleys, this psalm is just wonderfully honest. And there's honesty about David's relationship with God too. We find he has desperation. Desperation for God. Third tonight, David experiences desperation for God. We've seen David was low. His circumstances were difficult. It felt like his soul was surrounded by darkness. And yet, in all this, he still remembers the Lord. Just look at verse 5. I remember the days of long ago. I meditate on all your works and consider what your hands have done. David starts thinking on God's track record. He knows what the Lord has done for him personally. How the Lord helped him fight lions and bears. How he gave him victory over Goliath, the Philistine. And how he routed whole armies before him. And beyond that, he, he ponders maybe God's works in all creation. That he made everything from the microscopic to the macroscopic. From the very smallest plant and the dust of the ground to the planets and the stars and the galaxies. The Lord made them all and David ponders God's mighty works, all God's works. And he considers God's faithfulness to the people of days of old, his great saving works, delivering Israel by those judgments in Egypt, saving them at the Passover by the blood of a lamb, bringing them into the promised land, entering into covenant with them, dwelling amongst them. David considers all this, he considers the works of God, God's great saving deeds. He thinks of God's providence in his own life. In the midst of horrible circumstances, he remembers what God has done in the past. I don't know how that might make you feel. I remember sitting with a young man suffering with quite bad depression, and it seemed like it had been almost permanent for, for years. And to say to him, well, remember what God has done in the past seemed almost trite, out of tune with reality. As my friend hadn't known anything but numbing sadness for months, what use would speaking of God's works in the past be? And yet David does this. Yes, he feels the darkness surrounding him, but he knows one thing. If anyone can help, it's the Lord. Where else can I go? And so remembering what God has done in the past, verse 6, he cries out. He stretches out his hands. We read that, I stretch out my hands to you. I thirst for you like a parched land. He's praying. He's pleading for something from the Lord. Think of the desert wildernesses in Palestine. It's a parched land. Were we there this evening, in a few hours we would be gasping for water. Make that a few days and, and the smallest drop of water would be like precious gold to us. David's desperate just for a drip, just for, for, for the smallest sign of God's presence, for the Lord to just, just start to warm his heart, if only for a moment. Notice he says, I thirst for you like a parched land. It's not I thirst for victory over my enemies or I thirst for relief from my sadness. It's, I thirst for you. Of course he desired victory and, and relief, but above all, he's desperate for the Lord himself. And perhaps this helps us understand. 
previously, he had known closeness with the Lord, but as he writes, he doesn't experience that. So above anything else, he knows he needs the Lord. Whatever else happens, this is what he most longs for, to feel closeness with the Lord, to to know God's gracious presence. And from meditating on God's works in the past, he believes that, that somehow, for him, the Lord would be sufficient just as he'd been sufficient in all those circumstances through the past. And so he thirsts like a man in a parched land for something, anything from the Lord. Brothers and sisters, he's right. Our greatest need is fellowship with the Lord, to be close with the Lord. And yet sometimes it might seem that he's far away like he's forsaken us, like he's turned his face away. Like David, we might reflect on what God has done in the past, maybe looking back to days of joy, times of closeness with Christ, and yet in the moment we can be left feeling like this, feeling like we're in the spiritual desert, just longing for something and desperate for God. As David writes, he was facing deepening darkness and desperation for God. As we move into the second half of the psalm, it's clear that things haven't actually got better yet. Just look at verse 7. Answer me quickly, Lord. My spirit fails. He feels almost like hope is ebbing away. Verse 7 continues, do not hide your face from me or I will be like those who go down to the pit. Still, he, he prays, he's urgently seeking the Lord. He's praying, Lord, if you don't answer me, I'll surely slide all the way down into the pits. That could mean death itself or or just a permanent state of darkness. But you get the picture. He feels right on the edge of death. And here, in desperation, in a pit of darkness with no clear evidence of the Lord's presence, maybe we assume David might want to give up. But there is something that fuels his prayer. Something that gives him hope. Something that lifts this psalm. Look at verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. In the darkness, David looks for a dawn. In his desperation, he flees to the Lord as his refuge. And what's he hoping for? What would a a dawn after the darkness look like for David? Well, verse 8, it is the unfailing love of the Lord. Already we've seen his experiences, deepening darkness, desperation for God, but now we come to his hope. He hopes in the unfailing love of the Lord. In verse 8 and verse 12, he appeals to God's unfailing love. It could be God's steadfast love. The the Hebrew is the word chesed, a covenant love, a faithful love, a love guaranteed by the mercy of God to his people. It's a word that's used in scripture only of God's relationship with his people. And David himself knows this. That's why he started the psalm making clear that he didn't deserve anything from the Lord, that he was a debtor to mercy alone. That's why he appealed to God's faithfulness and righteousness from the start. And just start to think about the promises God has made for his people to be with them, never forsaking them. That's guaranteed by his chesed, his faithful love. To save them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, that's guaranteed by his chesed, his faithful love. Even bringing people through death and the grave to be with him. Again, guaranteed by his unfailing love. It's this covenant love that David appeals to. Verse 8, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. For I have put my trust in you. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord. For I hide myself in you. He looks to God. He trusts in God. He hides himself in God. He goes on in verse 11, for your namesake, O Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, same phrase there, silence my enemies, destroy all my foes, 
for I am your servant. For your name's sake, Lord. Lord, you've promised to save your people. You've put your character against this. You've promised to bring them through to eternal life, to vanquish all the enemies. Lord, you've promised. Do you see how David is appealing here? Lord, to go back on this would be to destroy the glory of your name. So he prays, Lord, for your name's sake, preserve my life. His hope is in God being true to who he is, being true to his promises of God showing the unfailing, steadfast love that he has promised to his covenant people. Brothers and sisters, this is always a safe refuge. To trust in the unfailing love of the Lord to his people. Jesus said of his people, I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Today we might face all kinds of situations But those words of Jesus, just as much as any other promise in the Bible, is guaranteed by God's unfailing love. Either he does this, he he gives his people eternal life, preserves them so they never perish, or he's a liar and his name is nothing. Whatever you face, brothers and sisters, come depend on the Lord, on his steadfast love that is guaranteed by his name, by his character. That is sure, solid ground. And yet as David trusts that, one day he will see the dawn of the chesed, the unfailing love of the Lord, when he's saved and rescued. As he speaks, that that day hasn't yet come. As he writes the psalm here, the dark clouds of his circumstances still haven't lifted, and so he prays on. Verse 8, show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. And verse 10, teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. In the here and now, he's praying for the Lord's preservation, even in the midst of his dark circumstances. He's praying here, In the valley. Lord, teach me to submit to you, to obey you, to follow your way. Even in this dark and gloomy land, Lord, lead me by your Holy Spirit onto level ground where I will not stumble or fall. David's hope is so wrapped up in the Lord. He he prays in the meantime, in the valley, while he's still awaiting the morning. Teach me your way, Lord. What a challenge for us. In dark places and deep valleys, shouldn't we pray, shape me, fashion me, grow my love and faith, keep me from sin, make my love for Jesus deeper and wider and higher and longer. In his dark circumstances, David is trusting one thing. Even if the darkness goes on for a long time, one day, the sun will rise. One day he will see the morning of God's unfailing love. And even in the meantime, he prays that the Lord would be at work shaping and fashioning him even in the deep valley. Maybe this encourages you. Maybe this strengthens your soul, I don't know. It is really wonderful, I think, to see David's faith on display here. And yet it's my experience that scriptures like this can sometimes feel a little bit too much. We'd love to have the kind of hope and and, and confidence that David has, but the the pressure of life, the the soul-sapping nature of the things we face make it seem like that's too far off. Maybe that we are too far gone for this kind of hope. I remember sharing with that friend, struggling with the darkness he felt, of how The Lord doesn't abandon his people. But as I said that, my my friend's spirit was really low. And he said to me, Tom, your words just feel numb. They don't seem to mean much. Maybe that's you. Maybe God's steadfast love, his unfailing love, almost feels disconnected from your life. Can I say tenderly, even then, 
this psalm can help us. And it does so by pointing us to something amazingly beautiful, something that underlines David's trust in the Lord, something that goes further still even, something that proves God's care even when we feel at our lowest, something that proves God's steadfast love will come in the morning. What's that something that is amazingly beautiful? Well, twice the words of this psalm make clear, verse 2 and verse 12, that it's the servant of the Lord who is praying. Now, certainly David is God's servant, but just as David is a type of Christ, his experiences here prefigure the experiences of the Lord. Just follow through the psalm with me. David prayed that God would lead him and that he would be able to do God's will. Christ was the one who really did do God's will, who was led by the Holy Spirit all his days in true righteousness. And yet, like David, he was despised and hated. He was familiar with grief and many hunted him. Many sought his death. And yet, Christ, the righteous one, was willingly counted among the transgressors. David writes here of feeling appalled in heart, of feeling one step from death, and as Christ was counted among the transgressors, that was his experience. In the garden, he faced anguish. In his humanity, he knew the rasping pain of forsakenness from God. And the horror was so appalling, he swept drops of blood. And on the darkest day, Christ was cut off from the land of the living. In this psalm, David cries out for relief like a man in a parched land. And in his desolation at Calvary, Christ cried out, I thirst. David prayed, hide not your face from me. Christ, in the pitch blackness of that good Friday, cried Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David feared the experience of going down into the pit. Christ in his manhood, in his body and soul, descended to the dead. My friends, I don't know what you face. I don't know if it sounds trite to say hope in the steadfast love of the Lord. But here is one reason for that hope. If you follow Jesus, your saviour knows what darkness is like. He has felt in his humanity desperation and he has plumbed the depths of death victoriously. Yes, we will not always know why he calls us to walk through deep valleys, but we can know this today. Our advocate in heaven, the one before the Father who intercedes for us, he is the one who knows, who cares who has even been into the pit. My friends, things don't stop there. Because Christ was perfect, fulfilling all righteousness, because he fully atoned for the sins of his people, because he submitted to his Father's will in every way, early that Easter morning he rose bodily from the grave. And this all fits with Psalm 143. Look again at verses 11 through 12. The prayer of the servant of the Lord. For your namesake, Lord, preserve my life. In your righteousness, bring me out of trouble. In your unfailing love, silence my enemies. Destroy all my foes, for I am your servant. For the glory of his own name, on that Easter morning, our triune God brought back from the dead his son, our Lord Jesus, preserving his life, conquering death. And in that moment, as Easter Sunday dawned, as the grave was burst open, he put his enemies, the evil powers, to flight and guaranteed the future glory of the church. Friends, this is our risen, conquering king. And nothing can stand against him. How can we hope in the unfailing love of the Lord. Look at verse 8 again. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Friends, look to the dawning of that day. Look to the morning that brought word of God's unfailing love, the day when Christ was raised. That morning 
is the dawn of resurrection life. And it guarantees that the day is coming and will surely come when suffering, depression, darkness, desperation and hurt are all gone and when we are with him and are like him. And Christians here today, can I say that day is coming all the closer. Yes, today we don't know all the realisation of these things. Today we still face darkness and desperation. Sometimes it might feel that the Lord is far away, but we know this. He will not and cannot go back on his unfailing love. If he's made us his people by paying the penalty at the cross and he's already secured our glorification by rising from the grave that morning, will he now abandon us and let Satan have the last word about us? Would he let the sacrificial work be undone? Would he let that morning be turned to darkness again? I think not. Jesus himself said, this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. Brothers and sisters, you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death. There may be many terrors ahead for me or for you, There could be deepest darkness, even that plunge into the pit of death itself. But we can hold on to this. The Lord has not failed, and his love shall come in the morning. It was secured that Easter morning. And today, even in the midst of dark times, we can rely on him, for he knows. He cares. And beyond all else, if we're in Christ, we know he has set his unfailing love on us. And so come resurrection morning, the last day, we will be raised to be with him. Raised out of the deep valleys, out of the pits, out of the darkness. This is a real hope. It's a real hope because of that morning when his unfailing love was displayed. And on that last great morning then, fully and finally and forever, we will know his unfailing love without the clouds and the shadows that seem to obscure and darken today. And nothing and no one will be able to snatch us from his hand, for darkness shall be banished. Friends, may our hope be this, that the morning has brought to us word of God's unfailing love. Amen.